This is actually my first subwoofer review, surprisingly. I have owned subwoofers before, home cinema types of the 90s, not particularly good ones if I'm honest. And as a noob to a subwoofer myself, I'm asking the question, do you actually need one? And in my immutable way, keeping it simple and nice and easy. A lot of people go on about acoustic treatments. I don't actually use them. It's because basically I have my lounge room as my main home living space as well, where I put my hi-fi. But that's not such a bad thing because a lot of people don't have them as well and I suspect probably more than most. So I can actually tackle this review from the perspective of the average setup and not from regard to overly damped rooms. I've actually been in the past of the opinion that subwoofers are not a good thing for hi-fi because of timing and integration type reasons. I'm trying in this review to find out if that's actually true and I'm looking at this from the perspective of how you set it up, how you tune it and use it, and what does this RHEL T7X actually sound like? The main thing to say about the design of the RHEL T7X is an 8 inch front firing active long throw driver, bit of a tongue twister that, and then on the underside you've got a 10 inch down firing passive radiator, acts as a kind of fill driver, and the front driver is powered by a 200 watt class AB amp, all contained in a gloss black or white case, and then on the back you'll notice the big heat sink for the amp and the panel controls as well. So there is a number of ways you can use this rail according to the inputs that you actually use. And the first is a 0.1 LFE low frequency effects channel. 0.1 because of the home cinema designation, the 0.1 on the end of your Dolby surround type system that you use. But this is obviously a two channel hi-fi channel, so I don't go into home cinema. But essentially, I'll keep it to the fact that you won't be going through the rails crossover and essentially all of the bass is being passed on so you get all that low bass from your movie soundtrack. Following on from that, the next type of connection you're gonna use is an RCA low level input. You could be using the sub out from your room correcting amplifier like an NAD M33 that uses Dirac or Bucart's i150 amplifier that I have at the moment. But essentially this input is for people that don't have the ability to use the high level connections, which I'll come on to. So that could be active powered speakers like Kef LSX or their LS50 Wireless 2, where you just use the sub outputs. So say if you're using a pair of active speakers digitally connected, you could be using something like this Blue Sound node, volume control on the top, digital out connection via coax here or optical here, and then you'd use the sub output, this one here, got it, to your rail sub and set the node on the widest setting so far as bass is concerned so that you can exploit the rails crossover and all the lovely filters in the rail. You might as well use the better means of crossing over the bass into your system. The juicy, really juicy connection of this subwoofer, if you like, is the high level connection. And that basically involves taking the signal off your amp's binding post and feeding it into the rail using a Nutric speak on connector. The idea is that the sub bass takes on the same character of your amplifier for better integration and timing. So, if you have this ability to connect the amplifier like this, you absolutely, absolutely positively must use it this way. And you might be thinking, well, I don't want to do it this way because of you know loads being placed on my amplifier or power being drawn from the amp itself. Well, 
I can assure you you don't have to worry about that because Rails say in their specs that the input impedance of this subwoofer is actually 150,000 ohms. So you're never gonna have those effects anyway. First thing that you're gonna see when you actually set this subwoofer up, when you look at their manual, which is actually on their website, by the way, if you're interested in reading it, is to set it up in the corner of the room for the longest and most linear bass wave to listening position. Now, I actually set mine up initially between my two CAF LS50 Meta speakers and my Hegel H390 due to room constraints because I've got items in the corners of my room and on the right-hand side to me, a kitchen. The first thing to do, the kind of numero uno thing to do in setup is to set phase. You want the phase of your subwoofer to be in sync with your main speakers. So when the driver of your main speakers moves out, so does the subwoofer's driver. The little switch on the back can either be at zero or 180 degrees, denoting opposite phase, kind of like that expression, I'm doing a 180 if you like. But the volume is always loudest when you've got the correct phase set because you don't get the cancelling out volume effects of in and out of phase signals. The tweaking of the crossover point and the volume knob is first done by turning the volume knob all the way down, setting the crossover at the lowest 30 hertz, and then bringing the volume up gradually until you start to hear the sub, then turn the crossover up bring it back down again until you get it to a point that you really like. By the way, you do actually get 120 hertz maximum crossover point. And if you work it out between the 30 and 120 and a number of clicks you've got on the back, it's roughly 2.25 hertz per click. Now I know that's not a linear amount because obviously like a lot of volume dials, they're not linear, but it does give you a kind of rough estimate, a rough guide to work with. I should mention, some say that you should use a crossover point 10 hertz above the lowest stated frequency response spec of your speakers. And with Kess LS50 Metas, I got the best balance that way, particularly with a range of different types of music. So I actually got the best sound combination with the rail and my H390 using the high level connections compared to low level sub out of the NAD M33 using a Dirac calibration. Now I'm not gonna sit here and say that high level is better on all occasions because I'm sure if you spend more time with Dirac and the low level outputs, you can probably get it sounding just as good but Dirac is a very complicated piece of software with lots of curves and a high level of learning. And frankly, I'd need loads more time with it. Another thing to say in this review about this sub and something that I wasn't expecting, I thought it would work best with smaller speakers, smaller drivers, for all those reasons of integration that I mentioned at the top of the video. But of all the speakers I've got here at the moment, KEF LS50 Meta, PMC 2523, Monitor Audio Gold 100, Bucart S400 Mark II, and I've also got still a pair of Dyna Audio EMIT 20s. It sounded good with them across the board, so long as you tweaked the crossover and gain controls perfectly to the needs of the speaker. 
One of the things I noticed is that when I turn the gain up playing that track Duke of Earlsfield by Sabres of Paradise, in my room it really helped with the speed, decay and percussive slam of that music. All those qualities were pretty dramatic with the subwoofer in the mix. But perhaps just as obvious, if you played a live recording, maybe something like this Doors in Concert album, one of my favourite Doors albums, by the way, it really gave that sense of presence. Again, something you wouldn't attribute to a subwoofer. You'd just be thinking, oh, I'm just buying it for bass. But if you play acoustic music with a guitar bass line, I played the Boy With The Arab Strap album from Bell & Sebastian, and also in that VT, Underworld's River of Bass, you can temper the amount of bass with the gain knob, remember. So essentially, you're tweaking the gain on the sub to your musical taste. But that's the point really about subwoofers that's misunderstood, and I misunderstood it too. Rob Hunt from Rail, when he came round to set this lone subwoofer up, is of the view that subwoofers are not just about increasing bass mass and depth, which is often how they're perceived, and it might seem counterintuitive to say this, but it's about bringing out qualitatively the nature of bass in the sub. Another massive thing is bringing the soundstage forward. So that applies mainly to any kind of mid-range vocal. But these review platitudes you see in subwoofer reviews that say things like they let the speakers get into their stride or you don't know the subwoofer is there are cliched but true, and when you try a sub, you find out, mm, yeah, I know what he means. <laughs> Using a sub in the corner of a room seem to integrate better into the central image of the speakers and also seem to be less placed. I'm sure that's to do with the way that bass works in the room and the omnidirectional nature of it. I actually tried mine in the corner even though my door is there just for the completeness of this review and for you guys. But remember, if you've got placement issues and you can't place it easily, consider Arrow as well. The other thing to say is the speed of bass with this subwoofer is actually quite impressive. And considering what you're paying and all the other things I've mentioned, to some it's gonna come more than what you might consider for an amp or speaker upgrade. So would I try this subwoofer if I hadn't reviewed it with the benefit of hindsight? Well, the answer is yes. And particularly on speakers like these Kess with a lowest frequency response of 47 Hertz, which isn't to contradict what I said before about primary benefits in other areas, it's just some speakers do actually benefit and these kefs are a case in point. So do you actually need a subwoofer answering the Saul Bass title of this film? Well I guess only you can really decide on that but based on my own experiences and quashing some of the misconceptions I've had before perhaps, for full-on listening of a hi-fi system you really ought to try. Mm -hmm.